Commissioner, can you give a little more detail about how he got into the building and sort of steps leading up to that? Yeah, I think that Hopkins, uh, Pete, certainly is looking to, on one, just a very um, uh, specific uh, um, analysis of yesterday of what point of entry into the building and uh, what systems they had in place all along there. So uh, I've spoken to Harry Koffenberger, and he's, you know, they're continuing that analysis, looking for camera views and that sort of thing. And I think that that's instructive um, in terms of us going back and critiquing and doing a self-examination about how we can uh, make the public safer? Is there some cue we missed? Is there something that, that we could do better? So Hopkins certainly is doing that. Um, we know that he had a handgun permit from the state of Virginia. We know that he was the purchaser of that 32 caliber Keltec semi-automatic handgun. I will tell you that, and, and you could, you know, I'm sure you could go online and get pictures of it. It's a very, very small weapon. I mean, the 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 whole thing would could be concealed in the palm of your hand, and so very, very small weapon. Um, and and so in terms of, you know, in recognizing an armed gunman and all of those things that people will theorize about, be it would be very, it would present a big challenge. Um, we're continuing our part of the investigation in terms of where he lived, uh, if he made any statements, you know, again, in, in an analysis of was there something missed and what could we do better. You have the video cameras now linked in with Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So was there anything that was on City Watch that they went back to look at to see if... Yeah, on the first rush, on the first rush, no one's come to me to say, "Hey, we got him here, and you know, we saw him doing this." I think a lot of that is still ongoing. You know, my detectives um, ha had the, you know, they doing what they do. It's homicide investigators, uh, Tony Feda and Juan Diaz, two of the best, led by Terry McClarney and his team. Um, you know, we had the post-mortem examinations to do today, and so there's still a lot that needs to be done. We're getting great help from the FBI. They were on the scene within minutes of uh, this event and offered a full array of services where we needed them the most. They stepped up, and that is helping us to develop background leads um, on um, Mr. Partis. You know, one of the initial concerns that we had because there was no communications inside room 873 was that we could not discount the possibility that he was at large in the Nelson building or he had made his escape into the general area and we were working for all of those contingencies and uh, developing strategies and putting uh, protections in place and trying to be literally steps ahead of where he could have been. What do you want to know? What, what questions do you have that beyond just curiosity of why he might have done this that would help you in future cases? Well, I'll tell you what I really want to know, and we'll work on this, is what we could do better in every aspect of that event. And if you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, because I'm so close to it and an active participant, I would give us high marks, frankly, for how the whole thing proceeded. Um, there were some missteps. None of them cost anyone their, you, you know, uh, hazarded anyone's safety, uh, but there are clearly things we could do better. And um, we do exercises, we do planning, um, but it's important to go back and critique what we've did and, and how we might improve for, for the safety of all Baltimoreans. And so this does accord us that window. How difficult is it in a situation where you have a basically a small city within a city and an institution that is almost impossible to shut down entirely? How much difficult is that for your tactical teams and what you did to sort of keep operations going? Yeah. I think there are a couple people should uh, not lose focus of all the things that worked there. And, and here's, here are a number of things that worked very well. In the initial phase, in the initial um, response to this, the communications between the BPD and Hopkins, and in particular Hopkins security, is, I'm going to bet on parallel. 
Uh, I was in direct communications with their security chief, Harry Koffenberger. And I knew where he was physically in that building. I had a very accurate assessment. Because remember now, in any of these things, whether it's in a shopping mall or, or you know, in a, in a uh, um, hospital, their security staffs are going to beat us to the scene. And they should if, if their system is working. And, um, you know, to have that kind of link. And he knows what resources we have because we work together and we, we don't just talk about it. We, we plan and we, we do exercises to try to strengthen those partnerships. But when those cops from the Eastern District responded, they all know Harry Koffenberger and know the people, individual members of his staff. And so their, their communications process was a home run right out of the box. The tactical deployments worked as designed. You know, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot here over the last three years, and we, you know, we tried to get you guys interested in diamond standard training and different aspects of it. I, I know the Sun has covered it, and your stations, Brian, you were out there to see it firsthand. But there's not a more demonstrable piece of that. And when you talk about active shooter training, and those men and women, it was the Eastern District Patrol officers that were the first ones up there to the eighth floor. Jim Kelly, d despite the fact that he's a former QRT guy, a SWAT team guy, his men and, and women weren't. And he was able to deploy them using the training that they've developed over, we've developed over the last three years to go there with a high degree of confidence. And uh, they have these officers on the first rush, Harry's, uh, Mr. Koffenberger's um, security staff, my officers, they have minimal protections. They have basic level uh, threat protection and soft body armor. But this is a man who's already demonstrated his willingness to, to hurt other people. And so I give them extraordinarily high marks in their training, their response, and their deployments. And then, of course, the SWAT team guys did what they, they uh, train and, and uh, get paid to do. And they did it very well. There's all this talk about upgraded security and metal detectors. Hopkins says it's not practical. Um, you know, I'm not going to ask you. To, well, you, you're welcome to issue a judgment on that whether you think they need it or not. Was this ever? Was this possibly preventable, or is this just someone who's going to? Do something no matter what. These, you know, the frustrations are. I mean, these are the frustrations we have in in protecting Baltimoreans in general, and not just at Hopkins, but across the city. And uh, I said earlier today to some other folks, you know, police officers, the security professionals, aren't equipped with X-ray vision. They're not. And uh, you, we, there are uh, it, there are measures everywhere in airports and and uh, public transportation systems in schools. There's there's enormous measures, um, but again, it speaks to the vigilance of all of us. I I I would like to think, is there some communication between a family member that we missed? Is there some communication between a staff? And these are the things that Harry uh, Hopkins is going to examine, and we're going to examine through our, our investigations. Should we have known, was there a clue that we could have picked up? But it's America. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I would not be a proponent of sacrificing people's civil liberties um, to the extent that it would, re would require to ensure that no one's got a pen knife in their pocket or a pair of nail clippers. And so, we, you know, we, we want to be reasonable. So you don't you want know them when to you have that gun? You know when he bought the gun or when? Yeah, um, I think he got the gun. He's, he's had the gun for a couple years. He's had the handgun for permit for about three or four years. So do you feel like he went in intent to do this? I, I don't see any premeditation. I have not, no one has communicated to me any level of premeditation. Um, I, again, back to our investigation, I don't know, we don't know yet if it was in his daily routine coming and visiting his mother that he always had that gun. Um, was this an, extra, was this an, um, an anomaly in his behavior? So, um, um, those are the things, the questions we're asking. Do you know too. more about what, what touched it off? Do you know more about the exchange with the doctor? Uh, yeah, I, I, I know basics, right? So I, the basics that I know was that his distress was over the prognosis for his mother. And um, uh, it, that seems to be what tripped 
um, this uh, this extraordinarily violent response. And you believe now he shot the doctor, went inside, took his mother's life in his own right? I think it happened all very quickly. I think uh, based on what, it, what we've seen in the crime scene, based on um, how the evacuation of the doctor played out and the, the security concerns of the staff, and we were there quick. I mean, it was a very, very quick response by all the security people. So, uh, and the, the scene really does lend itself to that. It probably was concluded very quickly. Commissioner, you talked early on about public safety. We're getting a lot of calls into WVAO radio about that. Yeah. A number of people are saying that they're canceling their doctor's appointments next week. They don't want to go there anymore because for the first time, they are really afraid of being in side of the hospital. Yeah. What can you say to those people? Well, I will tell you, I hate to draw my, my personal life into this, um, but I will. I will share this with you, and none of you know this because I don't talk about it. But um, my mother suffered a stroke over a year ago, and she's received care at a number of area hospitals. She gets treatment uh, two days a week. And this morning, she's at Hopkins Hospital getting her, her therapy, her physical therapy for uh, the recovery from her stroke. And I have zero concerns about her safety up there, zero.